Australia is blessed with rugged beauty and also has a wealth of natural resources. In the northwestern Pilbara region, billions of tons of iron ore gives the earth its rich red colour. Such minerals also power Australia's booming economy due to China's soaring demand for natural resources. They're going to spend about $1.1 trillion of money on their infrastructure. And what they're growing in is what we provide. But some Aboriginal elders say this wealth comes with a curse. If you destroy something, the land will destroy you. And that's what's been happening. Today, the country faces mining-related social, economic and environmental problems. I'm Chan Tao Cho. On this edition of 101 East, we ask, what is the cost of Australia's mining resources boom? Western Australia certainly has a very big mining industry and a rapidly growing uh, natural gas industry. And there is about $100 billion worth of projects either in construction or about to go into construction. There's another $200 billion of projects further back in the feasibility stage. The Chinese economy is growing at 8 or 9% per annum. It's impossible to sustain those kind of growth rates on a finite planet. And that's why we think it's very important to look at what's down the track. We build an economy based on infinite growth on a finite planet. And the mathematics say that you can't do that forever. Today it's about making money, but for us, one day you might have came, come back to this place, this place won't be this way, you know? This is where the money is. Australia has vast mineral deposits, especially iron ore in the Pilbara, which is used to produce steel. Not since the gold rush of the 19th century has there been such a mining boom here. Together with the natural gas industry, the resources boom buffered the country from the 2008 global financial crisis. Since then, the economy and the Australian dollar has grown from strength to strength. Mount Wilbeck is the biggest open-cut iron ore mine in the world, run by BHP Billiton, one of the biggest companies in the business. Australia's mineral sector employs some 200,000 people and creates up to four times that number of jobs in related industries, largely thanks to China. China primarily is Australia's number one trading partner. They're going to increase their roads to about 85,000 kilometres. They're going to increase their rail system about 45,000 kilometres. They're going to build a new airport. Okay? They're going to increase their automobile production by 90%. All of these things deal with steel. The money is good in remote mining regions. A truck driver in a mine site can earn at least $10,000 a month. Labourers fly in by the plane load, keen to make a quick buck. These fly-in, fly-out workers work two or three week shifts and fly home for their days off. But the lifestyle comes with a cost. We've got a lot of people working in the mining industry, earning you know, upward of uh, from $100,000 to $200,000 a year. The fly-in, fly-out worker, he's 2,000 miles away from his family, doing long hours and hard work. When he gets bad news from home, or when they have those arguments that you do have from home, it amplifies worse when you're by yourself. We have a lot of problems with depression, uh, suicide, and also uh, drinking problems as well. So that's my little bed. That's a little fridge for me there. Gerard Kennedy is a fly-in, fly-out worker. He knows the lifestyle only too well. He's showing his daughter what it's like when he's away. This is my little room. It's four by three. Little fridge there for some food and drink if I want to. This little block has uh, eight single men's quarters or single person's quarters as they call it. This is over here the dry mess where we eat uh, all of our meals, prepare our lunches. And this is the wet mess where you can go and have a social drink after work if you want to have one. We've just done 168 hours in two weeks. 
So, work's over. Time to pack our bags. Wait for my ride. Got about eight hours of uh, transit from Darwin back to Perth, from Site back to Perth. And then I get to see uh, Dee and the kids back at Perth Airport and have dinner at home tonight, which I'm really looking forward to. So, what part of what I have to do? For eight years, Kennedy was an electrician in Western Australian mines. He stopped in 2003 to start a family and a business in Perth, taking home less money. But watching the children grow, the couple knew they needed more financial security. This year, Kennedy resumed his flying flyout career in a gold mine in the Northern Territory. But being a transient worker with a young family is hard. If there's any problems on the home front, then you know, what can you do? You're a voice down the end of the phone and you, you feel quite helpless. And it felt like I was living two lives. While you're up there, it's like you've, they exist, but they don't exist, you know, unless they're on the phone or, you know, if you're checking your emails first thing in the morning or, you know, last thing at night when you're in your room, when the kids are sick and then you can hear, I can hear in a voice as you're getting run down. It's like, oh man, it's, this is what we're doing for the moment. We've got this end goal and it's, You've got to keep focused you know, on the bigger picture, keep your eye on the prize. Oh, you right? yeah. The prize is enough savings to renovate the family home and set up a fitness business in the future. But transient workers like him are sometimes blamed for the decline of community spirit in mining towns. They don't care about the town. The kids and their family don't live in the town. People won't live there because there's no infrastructure. So slowly but surely, you see the town die of the death of a thousand cats. To make these towns sustainable, the government is releasing land for residential and commercial use and stepping in with big money. Uh, we are spending around $1 billion in the Pilbara towns of Port Hedland and Caratha to provide uh, alternative housing, uh, apartment blocks, uh, more recreational facilities, uh, green parks, uh, uh, improved facilities in every respect. Some of these people that live here now will be uh, Rio Tinto employees. Such developments take time. Meanwhile, the mining boom is driving the cost of living through the roof. A flood of new wealth and workers is pushing rental and property prices to record levels. David Hipworth has lived in the Western Australian town of Karatha for 30 years and runs a real estate agency. The people that are here will think nothing of paying anything from 1300 to $2,000 a week to pay rent. Some of these houses only six years ago would have been worth possibly about $250,000. Now you'd probably end up spending probably $600,000, $640,000. So is this considered quite a nice part of town? It's considered a reasonable part of town. It's not the preferred area um, for folk to live because the infrastructure here is old. The preferred area, a small neighbourhood around a so-called Millionaire's Road, is out of reach for most people. So TC, this house that we're coming into now mm -hmm. is about 320 square metres under the main roof. It's a four bed, two bathroom family dwelling. It was erected probably about 11 years ago. It's got a granny flat under the main roof here, which uh, is all fully enclosed. And it's also got a double car garage, which is also sits under the main roof, extensive outdoor and patio areas. So if you were to compare a house like this, the value here compared to a similar house in say Perth or Sydney or Melbourne, how would it measure up? Well, the value of this house here is probably sitting around $1.4 million and a comparable property in Perth in a nice suburb would, would probably give him, take regard for age, probably about the $750,000 to $850,000 mark. Milk there. Deborah Napier has lived here for nearly 40 years. She wants to see the government move faster if it is serious about making mining towns like Karatha sustainable. We don't have a footpath completely around town. We don't, like I said, we haven't had a school built here for 15 years and the hospital's 25 years old. You know, my daughter's going to have a baby and they classify her high risk. So she has to go to Perth eight weeks early because they can't look after her in Karatha. Deborah Napier runs a beauty business in Karatha. 
With the resources sector driving up wages across the board, she struggles to keep staff. The majority of people don't want to work for less than $25 an hour. I have to try and match those wages. I can't keep doing that. Where am I going to get my money from? I'm a service industry, so I have to stay competitive and keep my prices down, but my overheads are higher. Business is struggling across the retail and service sectors here, even though flying flout workers have money to spend, because mining companies provide workers with meals and accommodation. They're not spending very much in the town. They just grab a few things that they might need, then they get back on the bus, at the end of their time, they get back on a plane and they fly back to where they come. The resources sector creates great demand for construction. Michael Parmenter is a flying flout contractor from Brisbane, on the east coast of Australia, more than 3,000 kilometres away. When in Karatha, he rents a house with five others to keep expenses down. Without the boom, um, they wouldn't be going ahead with so much housing to, to accommodate the boom, uh, which would leave me with nothing, to be honest. Back home, you'd be getting, at times, only two or three days uh, a week work, uh, whereas over here you, you're constant all the time. Easy passage to golf, fellas. We're going to block that off. When we go in this middle bit, all right, middle section, come in, please. Unlike many transient workers, Parmenter is involved in the community. He recently joined the Karata Falcons, an Aussie rules football club. Yeah, it's good. Make new friends, meet new people, and it gives you something to look forward to, uh, as opposed to sort of working all day and all you got forward, uh, to look forward to is going home and making your dinner and watching a bit of TV before you go to bed. If you play sport a couple of nights a week, you can cut back the amount of times you go to the pub, I suppose, which just helps the hip pocket and the liver. <laughs> The Karatha Tavern is a hot spot for locals as well as flying flout workers with money to burn. There's not much else to do in town for entertainment. We spoke with assistant manager Bart Parsons. There's guys here who I know who'd spend, you know, upwards of maybe a thousand dollars, including meals and, and beverages for, for, for a week, and they're here probably every day. Parsons has worked here for three years. The mining boom brings in more customers, but it can also bring more trouble. And we've gone from having no security three years ago to having four security every night of the weekend and so, you know, we do contain it, but look, it happens. Drugs are a big, a big problem in town, there's, there's no doubt about it. I think they're a big problem everywhere, but especially in this town. And you, on Sunday, Sunday mornings, we'll spend an hour, even before we open, getting rid of people that we know aren't going to be allowed to come into the venue. So we just stand out the front and go, look guys, you haven't slept, you know, <laughs> so you do see it. The consumption of alcohol in the Pilbara is much higher, probably about two and a half times higher than the state and national average. There is at times an element of the flying fly-out workforce who let themselves down and the community down by acting in antisocial uh, manners. When there's more people in a location, there's usually more interaction. Sometimes that interaction is not um, as amicable as it should be. And of course, uh, tempers sometimes flare and, and people are injured. The tavern reveals another flying flout job, lingerie waitressing. These women are also earning good money thanks to the mining boom. Parsons says they rake in between four and $16,000 a week if they do private shows outside their working hours. Some of these guys will throw $1,500 at them to just come and do lingerie wait waitressing for a couple of hours, you know, each per lady per night. So you times that by seven, then you add the wage that they get here plus the tips. It builds up pretty quickly.
I grew up in this region, I grew up in the Pilbara. My family actually ex explored and settled the Pilbara where the mining industry came along a hundred years later. Andrew Forrest is one of the richest persons in Australia thanks to the resources boom. Mining in the Pilbara region, his company Fortescue Metals Group has become a leading iron ore producer in recent years. Mining companies have to get their heads around the fact that communities must thrive and prosper where they are, not fly in and fly out. Now, we do it where we have to, but wherever we can, we encourage the communities and our people to live in those communities and build them up. Forrest has convinced employers across Australia to pledge 50,000 jobs for Indigenous people. By June this year, 4,000 were taken up, including in the resources sector. Even so, mining projects in the Pilbara continue to be controversial. Indigenous communities hold native land title rights over areas rich in iron ore. It creates long-drawn legal battles with companies over compensation for mining these sites. And that's what Fortescue faces in Roburn, a largely Aboriginal town in the Pilbara that once thrived from the 19th century gold rush. Simply because um, uh, you get a leader who thinks that because they've got a native title claim they should become a multi-millionaire um, and uh, we feel that people should improve by their own hard work and by the, their own opportunity. <laughs> Doris Eaton is a chairperson in the Yamatji Malpa Aboriginal Corporation. The group represents native land title claims for several indigenous communities and recently concluded a seven-year negotiation with mining giants Rio Tinto. She says such talks are not just about money. With a lot of secret sites, especially them hills, I know hills, you know. What kind of compensation would you be looking for if they were to mine in certain areas that you might feel is sensitive? Make sure uh, they look after young people, put them in training, get jobs and schooling as well. We only can do so much to protect our land because government got the last say. So what we are we're trying to do, get the most deal out of any mining companies, but with the sadness in our heart that it shouldn't happen. Some places that like artifacts, you know, they remove artifacts. But because they want to have pipeline running there or they want to dig in there, they've got to dig in there. Hundreds of thousands of ancient Aboriginal rock carvings can be found on the Burrup Peninsula in the Pilbara. Archaeologist Ken Mulvaney says they reveal how human culture and animal species changed here over a period of 30,000 years. The art has encoded that change of environment, that dramatic change from being basically a terrestrial environment to marine environment. Some of it relates to dreaming mythologies, the ancestral beings who created the landscape. Some of it are stories about behaviours. And then there are some such as hunting magic or species maintenance. We see those images in the art. The Northwest Shelf Venture is Australia's largest oil and gas development, run by an international consortium of six companies. It has supplied the state with natural gas since the 1980s. The construction of its plant on the Barup Peninsula destroyed more than 5,000 carvings. State Greens MP Robin Chappell fears more will disappear. It is actually the state government which is continuing to promote industry out in these marvellous uh, rock art valleys 
of uh, the Dampier Archipelago. The state government spent about $180 million on providing infrastructure for industry and then said because we provided the infrastructure you've got to go there. The problem is that we made mistakes in the past. We shouldn't be making those mistakes now. But Chapel is disappointed. This year, one of the Northwest Shelf owners, Woodside Petroleum, completed another liquefied natural gas venture here, the Pluto LNG project. It moved hundreds of rock carvings in the process. Many of these pieces of rock art actually directly relate to the next piece. They actually have references and relationships. And moving any breaks the whole spiritual and cultural perspective of what's there. Back in Perth, environmental activists are worried. Everywhere you look across WA, um, the mining industry is having a huge impact. Um, whether it's very localised in terms of destroying the habitat of native plants and animals, or broader impacts in terms of um, drawing down our precious water systems and polluting them, and creating a very big increase in our greenhouse gas emissions. Whatever the mining industry says it wants, the government delivers in terms of changes to legislation and so on. The industry disagrees. Its main body, the Chamber of Minerals and Energy, wants critics to look at the bigger picture. And I think we have to look at it on balance on both environmental, um, economic and uh, social basis. Then this industry uh, is uh, extremely responsible. The picture with China is that it will continue uh, to be the dominant customer and continue to grow. By trading with growing markets like India, as well as traditional partners, Japan and South Korea, Howard Smith says not all the eggs are in one basket. We're seeing a very diverse uh, portfolio which will act against uh, uh, fluctuations in any, any one market. The resource sector, in terms of uh, its operations, covers less than 1%. It's probably just over 0.5% of the Western Australian landmass. And after mining, then you know, we've got, uh, I would argue, uh, some of the best rehabilitation that takes place in the resource sector anywhere in the world. What we are seeing is, uh, through this decade, probably a doubling of iron ore production and a trebling of liquefied natural gas production. So there are growing pains associated with this. But at the end of this development cycle, those towns in the north will be far larger, far more sophisticated and very attractive places to live. But that comes with a price. Australia is at risk of what is known as the resource curse, a two-speed economy where one sector grows rapidly at the cost of others. Federal Green Senator Scott Latlam points out how retail activity and consumer confidence are suffering. Commercial rents have gone through the roof and people can't afford to run businesses. What it's doing in terms of the two-speed economy is making the rest of our exporters, um, they're working in a very, very tough environment. Sustained high Australian dollar and continued increase in labour costs and rents and so on. It's pushing people to the wall. We don't have to submit ourselves to a boom-bust cycle. We can plan with a bit of foresight now and put the infrastructure and the kind of economic base that we need for when the mining boom comes to an end, which it will. Nature has made Australia one of the world's richest countries. But when the boom ends, can Australia count its blessings or will it count the cost? We were told by our ancestors, you look after the country and the country look after you.